Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Sin is a reality in our life and in the life of the world around us. And today in our study of the key chapters of the Bible, we turn to Matthew 18. We're gonna see the priority of holiness and how to deal with sin in our life and in the life of a brother or sister in the Lord as well. I'm Russ Brewer, and you are listening to our daily podcast on the key chapters of God's Word, and today we're turning to Matthew 18. Now, as we turn to Matthew 18, it is clear that we are moving through this gospel quickly. This gospel, the gospel of Matthew, has shown us that Jesus was and is the long-awaited Messiah. He has come to establish his kingdom. He has told us how his kingdom people are to live, and he has even told us what it will look like as this kingdom expands. Now, during his earthly ministry, Jesus didn't just preach and teach. That's what we're mostly focusing on as we go through this gospel. But he also did all kinds of miracles to authenticate his message. He did things like healings and and just provision of like uh, food for everyone or power like controlling the water and the storms. And we're not going to look at all of these different events, but we just need to know that they happened because Jesus not only taught but confirmed his message over and over again in his earthly ministry. Now, all of that brings us to Matthew 18. As we're looking at Matthew 18, we're going to be looking at how kingdom people deal with sin. This important topic has an unlikely beginning in verse 1. In verse 1, the disciples are with Jesus and they ask him, hey, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? At this point, they've been walking with Jesus for somewhere around two years and they've been hearing about the message of the kingdom for two years. They've even been part of proclaiming this message as well. And so they're expecting this kingdom to be established any day now. And it's kind of logical for them to wonder who is going to be in which positions of prominence. And so they're asking the Lord, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus answers in verse 3, truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, wow, what a surprise. I'm sure they all were figuring, well, just by walking with Jesus, they were assured a spot in his kingdom. But Jesus sets them straight. You've got to become like a little child or you won't even get there. Now, what does that mean to become like a little child? Well, notice that word converted here. The Greek word for converted here means a turn around. It just gives us a great picture of what it means to come to Christ. We are turning around. We're becoming like little children. Now, on the one hand, this means having sincere childlike faith, but it also means much more than that. This also means having the humility of a child who has nothing to offer. You see, the very heart of the disciples' question reflects their pride. They were thinking that their accomplishments in this world would lead to a greater reward in the next. These disciples needed to take their pride down several notches and just become like little children. And so the person who has turned around here, who's converted here, they're starting over again as a little child. And just like a little child, they have forsaken everything they had in this world, everything they might have offered to God as a reason to gain entrance into his kingdom. They're forsaking all of that and simply come to the Lord as someone who is poor in spirit with nothing to offer. And so the childlike faith here is coming to God as someone who's dependent upon him for his mercy and grace just needing him to completely save us and carry us to our place in his home in heaven for all eternity. Now, as we go on in this passage, Jesus then gives a serious warning to those who might seek to cause these little ones to stumble morally. Now, there are so many ways we can sit in our world, and Jesus is even recognizing in verse 7 that stumbling blocks in this world are inevitable. But he tells us, "'Woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes.'" Now, this is something we rarely talk about in our world today. But there are, again, many ways to draw people away from a pure devotion to Jesus. And someone can cause other people to sin by doing things like maybe how that person dresses or maybe teaching something that dishonors the Lord or tempting people to pursue things besides Christ. These people who cause others to sin, they're going to be facing a compounding judgment from the Lord. We must never be one of those people. Verse 6 even says that it would be better for this person to have a millstone hung around their neck. Now, why would that be? Well, because they would stop filling up their ledger with their own sin and the compounding sin of causing others to sin. And so that's a solemn warning that we need to take seriously. In the midst of this teaching on stumbling blocks, Jesus then pauses to remind us of the spiritual principle of radical amputation. Radical amputation is a principle of just cutting out whatever is causing us to sin. And so here in this passage, if our hand or our foot is causing us to sin, it's better to cut it off than face God's judgment over the sins that it's causing. In our day and age, you think about what could we cut on out? Well, things like toxic relationships or online temptations or or really just squandering our life with frivolous activities. 
really there are many things in our life that we should really consider cutting it out. Things that might cause us just to do things that God says don't do. Or maybe things that just fill our time so we can't be doing the things that God says we should be doing. If these things are keeping us from being the person God has called us to be, we should engage in radical amputation and cut them out of our lives. Now, as we move on to this chapter, verse 10 then mentions that angels watch over these little ones. And, and this verse is a verse that many people go to to say that there are guardian angels. Each person has a guardian angel. Now, on the one hand, there are many passages that teach how God will send angels to protect his people. For instance, Psalm 34, verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Or in Daniel 10, verses 10 to 14, we saw how angels guard over the people of God. But just because angels guard over the people of God does not mean that each person has a specific angel who's just kind of hanging out with them all through life, just ready to kind of catch the stray objects that might be crashing in on them. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that God does send his angels to protect his people when they're in need. And so in this passage here, Jesus is building upon this principle and using that to explain that since God regularly sends angels out of his presence to protect his people because they're so valuable to him, in the same manner, we also ought to cherish all of God's people. Now, this same kind of care is demonstrated in verses 12 to 14, which speaks about the lost sheep. And then also in verses 15 to 20, which speak about restoring a wayward believer. In verses 12 to 14, again, Jesus likens the care of people to a rancher who has a hundred sheep. Now, over in John 10, 3, Jesus tells us he calls his own sheep by name. He knows his sheep. He loves each one so much. And here we're seeing that even if 99 were in his care and one was missing, he would do all he could to go out and find that lost sheep. And verse 13 even rejoices over the return of the one that had gone astray. Verse 14 also recaps this, saying that it's not God's will that any of these little ones would perish. Now, what are the little ones being talked about here in verse 14? Well, these are the sheep of God in verse 12, or going back to verse 3, these are the children of God. Now, when you think about this, the kind of care that God has for his sheep, he is asking us to extend a similar kind of care over one another as well. And so verses 15 to 20 contain what is commonly called church discipline. I'm not sure that's the greatest term here. It may be better understood as just church restoration because it reflects how the church has a role in restoring a lost sheep or a lost brother and sister back to the Lord. And so the purpose of this passage here in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20, it's to show us the stages of this restoration for a wayward brother or sister in the Lord. Now, these stages are typically summarized in four steps. Step one is in verse 15, where Jesus tells us that if we have a brother who sins, we should go and discuss the matter with him in private. In the vast majority of time, you go to your brother, you go in private and say, hey, this is what happened. Uh, that wasn't right. They'll be like, oh, I, you know what? I didn't see it that way. Or now that you pointed out, yeah, it's wrong. And they repent and we extend forgiveness and, and all is good. But every now and then, we'll come across someone who disagrees that they've done anything wrong. And then that requires the second step. Now, step two is in verse 16, where we take one or two witnesses along with us and we go again and, and deal with that matter of that sin. Now, perhaps these witnesses are there because they've also seen this offending behavior and they can encourage the sinning brother or sister to repent. Or maybe they're there and, and just kind of hear what's going wrong and they're like, hey, you know, um, if that's what you did, that's wrong. And it just helps to have another person, another brother or sister in the Lord, just in that discussion, just helping that person see, yeah, now there's agreement here, what you did, it's wrong behavior. Or maybe that brother or sister is just part of this discussion as a witness just to witness the fact that the conversation has taken place and this sinning brother or sister has been properly addressed. Again, almost always by this point, that other person, they're going to repent. They're going to apologize. They're going to recognize what they've done is wrong. And if they do, then nothing more is needed. And usually the matter should be, can be settled and forgotten. But there are times when a person is so stubborn about their sin and so unwilling to change their behavior that more people are needed to help on out. And so in verse 17, you go to step three, and that's where the whole situation is now brought before the entire church family. Now, this is not to embarrass the other person. It's not to tattle on them. It's not to punish them and just be like, you know, just kind of get them. It's to enlist the help of the church to reach out to that person and call them to repent. You know, just kind of going before the church and saying, hey, this is what happened. Can you guys reach out to him and let him know that this is wrong and he's got to repent? And hopefully that person will do that. Now, in all of this, we're at step three here. Let's pause for a moment and just pull in another passage of scripture. Let's turn our Bibles to Titus 3.10, which adds another element to this third step. So if you need to pause the podcast, go ahead. Let's turn to Titus chapter 3, verse 10. 
Now, here's the thing. Most of the kinds of sins that we might address are of a personal nature. The kinds of sins that we're talking about here are these ongoing character-based sins that are marring the name of Christ or, or the church and the world around us. And in these situations, the third step is a great step because the whole church family calls that person to repent. But there are times when calling that person would cause damage to the rest of the church. If the church were to be calling each of those people making that call, they would be hurt. And the times when that might happen is when the sinning person is being specifically divisive or factious, as in they're dividing the church into groups or, or, or just kind of calling for a mutiny or doing something that's just harming the unity of the church. In these situations, if the people of the church were to call them up, that divisive person would just be spewing out all this venom on, on, on why everyone else is wrong. And, and maybe some people will even agree with them. It's like, oh, you know, that's, that's what happened? And they're only hearing one side and they're agreeing. Or maybe it's like, oh, yeah, and less than, um, you know, Bob, he thinks this way about you too. And then suddenly the guy who's making the call is now upset with Bob as well. And the whole thing just gets to be a mess. And this person just be wounding the whole church family who is simply just calling them to repent and give up this divisive, factious behavior. And so that's where Titus 3.10 comes in. Titus 3.10 cuts out this third step and says, Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. And so here we're seeing that if a person is divisive and factious, you warn them once, you warn them twice, and after that, you directly remove them from the church so they won't cause any more harm to any more people. Now, going back to Matthew 18, verse 17 now brings us to step four. If a person refuses to repent, we are to treat them like a Gentile. Uh, not in the sense of being like mean to them, but recognizing that they need the gospel. They're not saved. They're so violating God's word that they can just sit there and just turn a blind ear to all these people. That's not a good sign. And so if we're treating them like a Gentile, that means we're not bringing them into the harmonious fellowship among God's people. Uh, depending on the situation, they might still be allowed to come to the church, but perhaps they lose their membership or some other privileges that are normally extended to those within the sheepfold. These people need the gospel, and so we should just be imploring them to submit to Christ as God and King and call upon Him as their Savior. Now, in all of this whole process of church discipline or church restoration, verse 18 then gives us this solemn charge or this solemn encouragement that Jesus has given His disciples the authority to take these steps even steps as serious as removing someone from the church family. Verses 19 to 20 say that if they were to pray about it and if they're to seek God's wisdom, they can know that Christ is guiding this process and will be part of that decision. Now, that's some heavy stuff. I recognize that. But we need to always remember the purpose of this is not to hurt others or embarrass them or shame them, but to restore them back to righteous fellowship with Christ and his people. If at any point in this process they ever repent, the process stops and they're restored. We don't need to have a person who has repented at step one and still come before the church and confessing it. I suppose there may be some situations, but by and large, that shouldn't be what happens. This is not to make spectacles of people. It's to help all of the people of God just walk in holiness before the Lord. And so that's just this whole process of restoration, these four steps. Going on, one last thing about forgiveness. The rest of this chapter is one long parable about forgiveness. Now, this parable is familiar to many of us because it's about this king who forgives this servant 10,000 talents. It starts with Peter asking Jesus, how often should we forgive our brothers? And he's being magnanimous. He says, how about seven times? And Jesus responds in verse 22, not seven times, but 70 times seven. As in just over and over and over and over and over again, Peter just keep on forgiving him. And then he gives a parable to explain why. The parable is about a slave who owes this king 10,000 talents. Now, back then, a talent was a measure of gold that was something worth about 15 years of labor. And so this slave owes this king so much, it would take 15,000 years for him to pay it off. In verse 26, the slave begs for more time, which is ridiculous because he'd need 15,000 more years. And in verse 27, the, the king has compassion on him and releases him of this debt, just lets it go. But then the very next verse, this slave who just got forgiven goes and finds another slave who owes him just a little bit, a hundred denarii. And that slave begs for more time. But this slave here, he, he refuses to give more time. He demands this, this other slave pay him back and he throws him in prison until he can. Now word gets back to the king. The king is angered that he has showed this mercy to this slave, but this slave then is so greedy with this other person and just won't give them any mercy. And so the king has the first slave thrown into prison. And this whole parable here is just to, to show the point that Jesus is making here. God has forgiven us so much, we just must be abundant with the forgiveness that we have offered to others. 
there is no place for a bitter, hardened heart among the people of God. And so now that's chapter 18. What are some takeaways? Well, we've got a long podcast here, so we'll be quick. The first is, do we have childlike faith, the kind of childlike faith that Jesus is talking about at the beginning of this chapter, a faith that sincerely trusts God, a faith that forsakes anything that we might offer as though we deserved heaven. And if we don't have that kind of faith, we need to come to God as spiritual beggars seeking to receive that kind of faith from him. Second, um, is there any area in our life where we are tempting others to sin? If so, we should forsake those places. Third, is there any brother or sister who needs a call from us to encourage them just to return to the Lord and walk in fellowship with him? And fourth, finally, is there anyone that we just need to really just, just finally forgive them, just settle things, realize we've been forgiven by God, and just give them forgiveness as well? And if there is someone we're struggling to forgive, let's just seek God's grace to just enable us to forgive that person as we've been forgiven as well. Okay, well, we'll leave things there. That's chapter 18. So great to go through it with you. I look forward to catching you tomorrow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening. God bless.